So you have, can we start? Will be, uh, the first lecture will be by Michael Lawton. I think uh, all the world knows him well. He's the chairman and professor at the, at the Morrow, successor of uh, Professor Bob Spetzler. This is legendary place and by many old as number one center in the world. So we are waiting, interesting, the guidelines for taking care of brainstem cavernomas, which uh, there is huge experience in, at Barrow on the treatment, surgical treatment of brainstem cavernoma. So I think this is the largest series in the world. So please, Michael, go ahead. It's muted. It's You're muted. muted. Uh, You're muted. There we go. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, good. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to go to um, my presentation mode. Can you tell me if you see my um, title slide? Yes. Sur surgery yes. for brainstem cavernovus malformations. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Well, um, Yuha, it's always great to see you. Um, you look well. Um, I, uh, I trust you're doing well in China, and uh, uh, it's so nice to see you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you for the, um, the uh, Academy for uh, having me here to speak on these um, brainstem cavernous malformations, which, uh, as Yuha said, I think we have the largest experience uh, in the world with these uh, between Dr. Spetzler's work and my own, um, I think we have uh, really um, become a, uh, the place for this. And so I wanted to kind of share with you my take on this. Um, uh, uh, on this disease. Um, so this first slide just uh, summarizes my personal experience. You can see um, um, if you add all these together, uh, over a thousand um, cavernous malformations that I've uh, taken care of over a 23 year period. And what uh, I thought I would do is just try and distill for you uh, some of the lessons learned. Um, I uh, am trying to capture all this in my next book, uh, Seven Cavernomas. Uh, it's in progress. The goals of the book are um, to develop a taxonomy for surgical approaches to um, advance this idea of tissue sparing approaches through the subarachnoid spaces, which I think is the beauty of cavernous malformations. Unlike glioma surger, surgery or some of the other surgeries we do, um, most of this surgery can be done by approaches through the subarachnoid space. Um, and then finally, um, it's a really ripe area for applying AI technology. And so um, we have an AI center here at Barrow. Uh, we're trying to apply that to some of the decision algorithms um, that we make. And uh, it, it's an exciting project, but still uh, in progress. Uh, these are some of the tenets of uh, the book, and um, I will t touch on some of these things. Um, you know, I think the first is just thinking about subarachnoid corridors to get to these lesions. And um, uh, since seven is my favorite number, there uh, I think about these in seven um, corridors as well, either through gyri and sulci, uh, through the sylvian fissure, down the inner hemispheric fissure, through the ventricles, along the tentorium through the petrous bone or through the foramen magnum. So these are uh, really the different corridors that we exploit to get there. Uh, this is a um, picture of my uh, beloved Marin Headlands in California, where I spent 20 years uh, living and working and raising my family. And when you look at this uh, scenery, um, you can't even see San Francisco in the distance. It's um, way over here in the, uh, you can see a tower there, but um, you see these rolling hills, and it's very um, easy to get lost in this open space. And what makes the difference is these trails. And if you understand the grid or the network of trails through the Marin Headlands, you can navigate this space and get to 
really some beautiful vistas, some great landmarks and uh, ocean views, city views and what have you. And I kind of view um, navigation and brain surgery in a similar way. This is um, how we've translated this idea of maps and AI um, and navigation to a Tesla. This is um, a view of um, uh, the Tesla taking me home in the evening to my house. Um, but I think we can do the same um, with these approaches. And um, one of the things that um, uh, is so pivotal is really understanding the arteries. The arteries are really like those red lines on that map that I showed you. And if you really understand um, the arterial anatomy, and if you think about it or talk about it in terms of segmental anatomy, then every piece of that vascular tree has an address. And you can use those addresses in the same way that the GPS uses your position in your car to take you down the highways or down the roads to your house. And so that's kind of Lost the audio there, Mike. Need to change the slides also because we are seeing two slides: the incoming slide and the projected slide, presenting slide. Can you hear me? The, the yeah, now out. we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, was I muted before? Yeah, yeah. just for a few seconds. Oh, okay. You, you uh, caught all the other stuff. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, sorry about that. But yeah, uh, yeah. Dr. we're seeing two slides in your presentation: one, the incoming slide, and the presenting slide. Uh, okay. uh, let me let me do this. Um, let me re uh, reboot here. Hold on a sec. Yeah, okay. For some reason, it uh, it switched. Okay. Take, uh, take your time. Take your time. Share this one. <clears throat> and let me play that. Can you see now um, one slide or two? Uh, I can see one. Okay, good. Right. And... Um, I think this is where I left off before. Yeah, segmental this, address. Yeah, okay, good. Um, right, so um, the idea here is um, once you know where the malformation is and you find um, its relationship to the arterial system, you can use that as a way to navigate the subarachnoid spaces. That's the, the, the idea that I was getting at. Um, the, uh, the next idea is that of triangles. I, I feel like um, what really helps me in navigating some of these spaces is to use nature's triangles to orient ourselves. And um, these are examples in aneurysm surgery of triangles that I found really valuable. This is one that we published um, just uh, a year or two ago, this junctional triangle between the A1 and the A2 that's very useful to help um, mobilize the recurrent artery out of your way and get to ACOM aneurysms that are superior or posteriorly projecting. Here's another one, what we call the pre-communicating trial triangle that gets you to the A1s uh, underneath the complex for your proximal control. These are triangles that we use in basilar uh, bifurcation surgery where uh, primarily this carotid ocular motor triangle here uh, is seen. Um, the um, uh, carotid optic triangle is another triangle that we sometimes use for basilar aneurysms that's a little bit more limited. And here um, in orange is this uh, super carotid triangle. Over here in this third uh, illustration, you can see the oculomotor tentorial triangle. Here, this is what I call the bypass triangle because you have access to the P2 segments, the S2 segment, and it's a great spot to bring in a, a radial artery graft or do a side to side um, but again, these are all different examples of triangles that help take us to places in the um, subarachnoid space where we can access surface anatomy, vascular anatomy, and in this case, cavernous malformations. 
Other examples of triangles, this Bago accessory triangle is one that we published on years ago. It's outstanding for pica aneurysms, great for pica bypasses. It's great for V4 segment bypasses and aneurysms. Here's another of the uh, triangles over here, the um, uh, glossopharyngeal cochlear triangle between the lower cranial nerve bundle and the seventh and eighth nerves is, is um, really valuable for petroclavial meningiomas or for macrovascular decompressions and for uh, high riding picas um, and other vascular lesions like ica aneurysms. Uh, so again, triangular anatomy that helps lead you through your critical structures to get to uh, the pathology. Here are more triangles. Troutman's triangle is an example. Some of the suboccipital triangles in the soft tissue are vago accessory triangle once again. But if you gather all of these together, you can see uh, there are uh, a dozen in the intracranial fossa. There are another dozen in the middle cranial fossa and cavernous sinus. There are uh, posterior cranial fossa triangles. These are uh, nature's windows for orient orienting you and um, guiding you through this, uh, this maze of anatomy to get there. When you arrive, um, surface anatomy is really critical. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about surface anatomy because uh, I could uh, spend uh, several of these lectures talking about this level of detail. But suffice it to say, when you understand the anatomy, you can then um, identify what we call the entry zones, um, safe areas where you can access malformations that may not be right on the um, brainstem surface but might require a little bit of um, transgression of the tissue. You have to know uh, where you can get away uh, with that transgression and where you can't get away with that. And these are some examples of these uh, entry zones. Now, um, this uh, is a topic that both Yuha and I have, um, have spent some time thinking about, uh, and that is a um, cavernous malformation grading system. Um, I um, focused my attention on the brainstem, and I know Yuha and his group in Helsinki uh, looked at a more global uh, system. The reason I chose to focus on the brainstem is because um, in most cases, I think the um, spinal cord and the cerebral cavernous malformation decision-making is pretty straightforward. Um, if there's seizures that are intractable, if there are hemorrhages that are symptomatic, these are decisions that really lead us to take them on surgically. Whereas for the brainstem, it's a lot more difficult. And so I felt like that's where we needed the help in developing a heuristic or a, a rule of thumb to pick patients for surgery. So we, we developed this brainstem cavernoma grade um, and uh, I tried to model it after my supplementary grading system, um, which we use for ABMs, just so people will remember. So it's got some of the same um, uh, pieces of it. There's a size component. There's an eloquence component, which instead of pure eloquence, since the brainstem is entirely eloquent, it's does it cross the, mid the midline or not? Uh, so that's the M point. It's a metric uh, of eloquence. V is for the venous anomaly, just like for dra draining uh, venous drainage for an AVM. And then if you think about our supplementary grade, we have an age component and we have a bleeding component. And in this case, we have uh, points assigned for age uh, less than or greater than 40 and hemorrhage, you know, the chronicity of the hemorrhage, whether it was acute, subacute, or chronic. And you can see in this table how you can assign these points uh, to arrive at a grade. And what's so useful about the grading is that you can, again, uh, like all of these grading systems, draw a line in the sand where if you're below a certain threshold, you can feel safe in deciding or recommending surgery. If you exceed that threshold, um, you may not. Uh, and so for this, uh, it's the grade sixes and sevens. Um, we put together Dr. Spetzler's BNI cavernomas and my uh, BNI plus UCSF cavernomas, and we validated the system. And you can see here uh, that whether you look at um, modified rank and score greater than two, or if you look at change in neurologic status or worsening, uh, you can see that there's a rising risk as you go up in grade. And that uh, line between five and six really is a very useful cutoff. So here's some statistics. If you have a grade six or seven, um, and if you're looking uh, at neurologic worsening, uh, you're going to have a 40% chance of worsening if you choose these high-grade brainstem cavernomas, whereas if you choose these low-grade ones, 
your risk is 12%, which I think is quite acceptable. So I would encourage uh, those of you who are trying to um, are wrestling with a decision to maybe run it through the brainstem cavernoma scale and uh, see what you think. This is just um, some more statistics looking at the area under the receiver operator curve and um, our AO AUC was 0.73, so it's a very good um, guide for this. So at this point, I'm gonna just show you examples because I think that um, showing you case examples is a very useful way to um, uh, demonstrate uh, some of these principles. And um, I'm gonna start with this one. This is a thalamic uh, brainstem cavernous malformation or deep cavernous malformation. It's a patient who presented with homonymous hemianopsia. Uh, imaging showed a lesion, which I'll show you in a minute, that was in the midbrain and thalamus. Uh, the brainstem cavernous malformation grade was basically a three, so under the cutoff. And for this one, um, I'm gonna show you a, an approach that we uh, published and uh, I'm trying to popularize because I think it's a wonderful approach. I call it the contralateral supracerebellar transtentorial approach because it takes you to the inferior surface of the thalamus from behind. It uh, is a great alternative to these transcortical roots that would go through a lot of tissue uh, it's a great alternative to a more lateral supracerebellar approach, and I think it's better than the transylvian transinsular approach, which uh, is another one. Uh, so here's the lesion. You can see, if you look um, on all sides, it's really covered or surrounded in critical tissue. Uh, you can't get there from above. You have to go through quite a bit of tissue to get there from the side. But if you look really carefully at this image here, and you look at the ambient cistern, you can go from the tectum here into the quadrigeminal cistern and around the corner to the ambient cistern and come to where this arrives at the surface. And even though it rises quite a distance up into the thalamic region, uh, you can get there by uh, doing this in the sitting position. So um, that lateral trajectory is achieved by going contralateral, starting on the opposite side, on the outside of the patient, crossing the midline and going over to the opposite side where the lesion is, that gives you that extra lateral extension. In order to get that, you need to cut the tent. And um, this shows you the advantage of the sitting position. When you have the patient seated and the gravity pulls down on the cerebellum, you can rise very high into the thalamic region and get to this. So it's the sitting position, gravity retraction of the cerebellum, and that allows you to ascend into the thalamus. Here's that uh, transtentorial component uh, the more lateral you go uh, into the thalamic re region, the more you run into the tentorium. So you have to cut that. It opens up this corridor. You can follow the basal vein of Rosenthal around the corner and you can get to the lesion. So here, um, uh, here Approach was selected. This is done in the sitting position. Here is the, uh, the video uh, showing the uh, position. Patient is seated. Uh, we just do a simple midline uh, incision for this. And uh, you can see that when you go over the cerebellum and cut the tent, uh, you get a really nice view uh, into that space. So um, here we are looking at the uh, cerebellum. One of the first moves is just to take a little CSF from the cisterna magna down low. That relaxes the cerebellum. And now, um, uh, we're, we've got this nice view here, uh, looking over the cerebellum, uh, and we've arrived all the way at the level of the tentorial incisura, just with gravity retraction. So here, straight down the midline to start, you can see we've got to march all the way out laterally. And uh, even though um, I'm in the seated position as well, and I'm at full arm's reach uh, at quite a distance, you can see that um, I can still comfortably operate. I'm going in between the occipital lobe here and the, uh, the tectal plate here, I'm following these branches of the PCA. And as I keep going laterally, I'm now entering the ambient cistern from the quadrigeminal cistern. This is that tentorial incision that allows the um, dissection to continue further laterally. And you see that just by making this um, notch in the tent, this is what allows the occipital lobe to retract. Now here's the, the angles that we achieve. Um, this is why that contralateral 
trajectory is so nice. I'm swung over to the patient's right side. I'm all the way on the patient's left side. And now you see we have that perfect angle. This is now where the lesion comes to the surface. You see a little bit of hemosiderin stain right there. I have to go through about two millimeters of tissue, but I immediately reach the uh, hematoma and the malformation underneath. So now um, you can see malformation. Uh, the resection is uh, fairly routine. Uh, here you can see portions of the malformation. You can see um, after evacuating the clot, how um, we can define those borders. The lesion in this case is coming out piecemeal, uh, but you can see that nice trajectory over the cerebellum, which is here in the foreground, right by the tentorium here, uh, and it, uh, deep up into the thalamic region. And again, because uh, I'm looking upward, um, I'm able to uh, reach to the high end of the malformation. And you can see uh, piece by piece, more and more of this comes out here now at the end. We've got a nice clean gliotic margin. This is what we like to see at the end and just a very careful inspection, making sure that there aren't any hidden corners. And you can see in this view how we've reached all the way to the very top and very lateral extent through this supracerebellar transtentorial window. There's a, a nice overview. And again, um, you can see how um, by swinging over to the opposite side, um, we, we can get uh, we can get that good resection. So here we are post-operatively, a nice clean cavity, uh, and we've violated only those two millimeters of tissue right over here at the very bottom. So um, that, that's a nice example of one of the cases. I'm gonna show you another midbrain thalamic lesion. This patient um, presented with hemiparesis, their nerve palsy, upgaze palsy, um, similar malformation, but for this one, um, I'm going to show you the, the approach from above. And uh, this is a contralateral transcolossal transcoroidal fissure approach. And the reason I've chosen that one is that when you study these films, you see that in this case, uh, it's not all that different from the previous one, but it comes to the third ventricle surface here, just below the fornices. And that's the ideal way uh, to approach this one. So uh, this is now our uh, view, uh, the corpus callosum here has been opened. I'm now in the lateral ventricle. We're looking at the foramen of Monroe right here. This is the um, septal vein here. This is the choroidal uh, fissure here that's coming into view. This is our thalamostride vein going into the internal cerebral vein. And by carefully following the fornix, this is the fornix here at my pointer, uh, we can um, open up the choroidal fissure, which in essence is enlarging the foramen of Monroe. So I did divide the septal vein there, which is fine to do. And as you follow the internal cerebral vein into the velum interpositum, you now have this doubling of the foramen of Monroe in size in order to come directly down on the uh, lesion that's coming to the surface in the third ventricle. So here is that view from above. We have a nice view. This is the internal cerebral vein. We've opened up the velum interpositum, gives us a, a perfect top-down view. And again, uh, the dissection here is this um, peeling, it, peeling away of the lesion from the uh, thalamic uh, tissue. So I, in the interest of time, will um, speed up some of this dissection. You can see here some more fresh hemorrhage. When you see fresh hemorrhage, it's uh, an easy um, opportunity to um, decompress the lesion internally. You can see more of the clot, that fresh clot coming out. And as we, um, as we get to the end here, you can see this is the aqueduct looking down posteriorly. We've reached all the way to the bottom. This is a nice clean uh, thalamic uh, wall here. So I'm just inspecting to make sure that uh, everything is clean. And now this is a beautiful view. I wanted to show you this. This is through the uh, floor of the third ventricle looking down on the basilar apex. Those are perforators coming off of the basilar. And this is the kind of view that you get uh, when you come down directly from above.
This is uh, just another view in the back looking at the resection cavity. Um, and uh, here's a nice overview showing the uh, widening of the choroidal fissure, the internal cerebral vein, aqueduct of sylvius, a view into the atrium of the lateral ventricle. And this is that choroidal fissure taken um, uh, to about a two centimeter opening to get this very large malformation out. So um, this is just another approach for the, um, for the uh, midbrain and thalamic lesions. You can see it gives you a, a different perspective. Uh, this was the resection achieved in this particular patient and um, uh, a different, uh, different way of doing that. Now, uh, let's go down to the midbrain proper. This is um, uh, our next case. This is a um, similar position um, uh, of the lesion, but we're going to do uh, a straight classic lateral supracerebellar transtentorial approach. The patient presented with hemiparesis, disconjugate gaze, lesion has a brainstem uh, grade of two, and uh, this is going to be a retrosigmoid approach going over the top of the cerebellum laterally uh, and also with uh, extension through the tentorium. So uh, here's the lesion. As we study this one, you can see that um, this really does come to the surface at the midbrain on its lateral surface, just along the crus. And so a lateral trajectory is a nice way uh, to do that. If we look over on these coronal views, you can see the ten tentorium is right here. So by going along the tentorium and working our way up, uh, we can get around this. That's why we need this transtentorial extension here. Uh, so again, um, I really like the sitting position because it drops the cerebellum. Uh, gravity opens up the planes for you very nicely. You can see the anatomy of the basal vein of Rosenthal. Um, you can see the anatomy of the third nerve. You can see the anatomy of the SCA. There are very few landmarks in this little window here, but these are your key landmarks to, um, to focus on. So uh, this is the uh, uh, exposure. Um, the patient had a prior um, uh, central neurocytoma, so you saw the shunt. Uh, this is uh, the lateral approach. I'm taking one bridging vein here that's along the tentorium. There are always these arachnoidal adhesions here laterally at the corner of the cerebellum that you need to release. But once you release those, uh, it gives us this beautiful view along the tentorium all the way down to the ambient cistern. So this is the arachnoid of the ambient cistern down in here. I'm dissecting along the uh, arachnoid. You'll see, once again, fourth nerve coming into view. This is one of our important landmarks. You don't see it yet, but here we do. Here it is as it comes up from the cerebellum mesencephalic cistern. It's climbing up to the uh, its dural canal in the um, tentorium. And you can see for the first time the uh, appearance of the malformation on that lateral surface. So I'm at the very bottom of it. I need to look more superiorly. So I'm going to incise the tentorium. This is that cut in the inside uh, tentorial incisura that allows me to um, extend my reach up. And you can see once you break through and cauterize that little tag of dura, um, we can see all the way up. We can follow the basal vein of Rosenthal, and you can see with that additional dissection, we see the lesion now uh, more clearly coming to view on this lateral surface. These are some of these um, posterior choroidal vessels, circumflex uh, perforators to the midbrain. We have to sweep those away and protect them. But now um, that we have a clear unobstructed view, you can see how this thing has come to the surface right there. It's actually an ex what I would call an exophytic malformation and we can now get inside through that presentation on the surface and the dissection at this point is similar to um, some of these others. You can see um, the uh, stealth showing the trajectory over that lateral portion of the cerebellum. It gives us a nice view. Uh, the challenge here is to get to the upper portion but you can see that in the sitting position, the uh, malformation, just as the cerebellum drops with gravity, the malformation also uh, drops with gravity. So as we work these planes free, you can see the um, malformation slowly coming free on the upside. And 
and you can see a large piece coming uh, out there. And uh, you know, piece by piece, we uh, continue to uh, remove this and uh, ultimately get all of it out. Um, you can see that um, our window is small, but gravity really is making things uh, easier and better for us. So these are the final pieces. We're seeing gliotic tissue on the deep margin here. Uh, it's nice and clean. Uh, one last piece here. And now as we inspect, you can see that nice gliotic plane. Um, there's the gravity retracted cerebellum and um, a nice resection. So um, that's really pushing the lateral supracerebellar approach up uh, into a higher reach by cutting through the tentorium. Uh, here's another example of a uh, midbrain uh, cavernous malformation. This is um, presenting on the front of the midbrain here on the cerebral peduncle. So for this one, we're going to come from the front. We're going to do a uh, transylvian uh, orbitozygomatic approach, just like we would for the basilar bifurcation. But instead of going to the apex, we're going to go lateral to the midline, and we're going to come to where this presents to the surface, um, just in front of the, uh, the peduncle. So this requires uh, a sylvian fissure split. This is the frontal lobe here. The temporal lobe is over here. And as we uh, split this, we get right down on the um, carotid cistern here, the optic nerve. We've shown here the carotid is over to your right. This is the interoptic triangle. I like to um, release some CSF from the lamina just to relax the brain. But now uh, the third nerve comes into view. This approach will now follow the third nerve back. You can see um, we're uh, cutting membrane of Lilliquist here and following third nerve back. And as we do, um, you can see that interpeduncular cistern opening up for us and uh, bringing us to the cerebral peduncle where this malformation will come into view. Here's the third nerve over here. This is um, the superior cerebellar artery underneath the third nerve and just below or deep to that is the malformation. You can see once again, it's exophytic. When you choose your uh, approaches properly, these lesions will come right to the surface uh, and in this case, this was right on the cerebral peduncle. Uh, I'm going to just re really go to the end to show you the um, removal of this thing. Quite large in size, required um, really careful, meticulous dissection of these perforators off of the um, off of the face of this. But now, uh, once it's free, you can see I'm working it out of the midbrain. It's going to come out in one large piece. And once again, this is all through a transylvian exposure, uh, one retractor on the temporal pole for that pretemporal view. And uh, here now, just an overview showing the basilar bifurcation, the third nerve, the mammillary bodies, the uh, transylvian exposure, really nice route for lesions that present uh, anteriorly. And here is the postoperative uh, uh, imaging. Uh, now, going down to the um, Pons, um, for these pontine lesions, the real workhorse is this transmittal cerebellar peduncle approach. And uh, I'm going to show you this case. This is um, a patient that, uh, a lady that presented with a brainstem cavernous malformation grade two. She got points only for her age, uh, small in size, not crossing the midpoint, no DVA. Uh, and this was one that had bled acutely. So um, she gets a grade two. Uh, this is done through an extended retrosigmoid approach. And um, here now is the, uh, the imaging for this. You can see it's squarely in the middle cerebellar peduncle, right on the lateral edge of the pons. And um, the, uh, the transmittal cerebellar um, uh, uh, peduncle approach is perfect. So these are the key points for the technique, uh, opening the petrosal fissure, finding the right entry zone, and then developing your trajectory. And let me take you through that. This requires what I call the extended retrosig where you skeletonize the sigmoid sinus, you really pull the dural flap forward, and you maximize what you can get from this extended retrosigmoid exposure. Now, if you just go into the CP angle, that will take you along this blue line here, and that's really the wrong trajectory. What you have to do is you have to angle back in order to get along the axis of the lesion. So uh, that requires that you uh, 
find this trajectory along the green line. It means rotating that natural anatomic angle about 30 degrees or so posteriorly. And in order to do that, you really have to open up what I call the sylvian fissure of the cerebellum, which is the petrosal fissure. And uh, this uh, petrosal fissure is the fissure that lies between the superior lobule here and the inferior lobule leading into the flocculus. It's right here. And as you open up that fissure, uh, what you find is the lobules part their ways. You can get a much la more lateral and expansive view of the peduncle all the way out to its lateral most extent. And if you use that lateral most extent uh, as your entry, your safe entry point here, then uh, you get the right trajectory. So let me demonstrate that in this case. This is um, now the extended retrosigmoid exposure. This is the view into the uh, cerebellopontian angle, and this is that petrosal fissure. So as you split the fissure, you'll find branches of ICA. You'll see the superior lobule over here. You'll see the inferior lobule over here. And by splitting the arachnoid in between, um, you can um, get right down on the peduncle. So here is the DVA, the venous malformation, uh, in this case, uh, that swept aside. This is looking uh, up at the trigeminal nerve. And um, what we're going to do now is just continue to split that fissure so that we can get the right trajectory. Here's the view into the CP angle. And you see it's really tangential on the lesion. So what we need to do is we need to walk back on the peduncle even further. So I'm going even more laterally into that petrosal fissure. I'm following this branch of ICA just as I would if I were splitting the sylvian fissure. And here now is as far lateral as I can get on the peduncle. It's where the two lobules come together. And I'm going to use that as my entry point. And when I use that as my entry point, you see how I've shifted that trajectory. Now I've got the lesion in the line of axis of uh, the trajectory. They're, they're paired up beautifully. And so I can go in. This is my entry zone here. I'm going to go through uh, about a centimeter of tissue in the middle cerebellum peduncle. But because I'm so lateral, uh, it's very well tolerated. This is just a little finger of that venous malformation, um, which I can divide. And just deep to that, you'll see some staining of the peduncle and finally the malformation here. So there's the malformation. By working the subarachnoid dissection and working that fissure, we get the perfect shot at this malformation. So now I'm inside, I'm evacuating some of the uh, acute hematoma from there. And this is one that comes out very easily. I'll just uh, accelerate. Here you can see some of the malformation in the cavity. I'm using, once again, my uh, dissectors. These are, by the way, some very nice dissectors that we developed with Mizuho. Um, and uh, it helps you really sharply dissect these separation planes. And uh, here, the lesion comes out nicely. This came out almost as uh, one piece with capsule preserved. I prefer to take them out that way. That way I know that I've gotten the entire lesion. And you can see uh, in particular this one, you can see that nice trajectory through the lateral most part of the peduncle into the axis of the lesion. And as we inspect, you see healthy gliotic pons around that. You can see preservation of the venous malformation. And look how lateral we are in that entry point into the peduncle. Very important point. This is the fifth nerve, uh, totally protected and safe. And uh, the venous malformation joining Gandhi's vein up here on the tentorium and so forth. So there's the post-op view. Um, I'm getting a little short on time. I'm just going to show you maybe um, one more case. Uh, this is a medullary brainstem cab mal, uh, brainstem cab mal grade of four. Uh, I'm going to do this through a far lateral approach. And uh, here are the films. You can see it comes to the surface on the lateral side of the medulla. So I'm going to want to come laterally uh, in this direction. Uh, there was too much tissue here on the floor of the fourth ventricle for me to go transventricularly. So I decided to go lateral, but it creates a problem. If I'm coming in this way through the far lateral approach, the axis of the lesion is actually uh, into the medulla, so it makes it a bit more challenging, and you're going to see that now 
uh, in this video. This is the far lateral exposure. The uh, cerebellum is up here. The uh, spinal cord is down here. This is the condyle that's been removed. This is the inferior petrosal vein that I'm dividing. And I'm going to get myself into this vagal accessory triangle where you can see this, this discoloration of the olive. And um, remember, the axis of the lesion is actually into the medulla medially. So I've really got to start looking this direction here, which means moving my body position to the right and trying to see as medial as possible, which I think that was the, the challenge in this case was to have this kind of a view, but to be working the lesion out from this hidden place more medially. So let me just uh, go forward. This was one that was removed piecemeal. You can see how I'm having to uh, pull portions of the lesion into my working corridor from the medial side. It's coming out piecemeal here. But you can see that by um, working those planes and constantly trying to maximize my view, uh, I, I can see it all. This shadow over here is my hand. I'm up against the condyle. I can't go any further lateral to look medial. So my instruments and my hand are getting in the way a little bit. But you can see here the gliotic planes are coming into view. And uh, <clears throat> I'm able to finally get around this thing and get it all out. So here in the end, uh, a nice clean resection cavity. Here's an overview showing pica, the lateral medulla, the far lateral exposure, and how lateral you have to shift in order to see into that small uh, working space. And here's the, uh, the postdoc. So um, <clears throat> let me um, jump ahead now and finish up because I think we're out of time. I'll spare you the, the last few cases, but <clears throat> I just want to make a couple of closing remarks, you know, um, when we think about surgery of the brainstem, there are many approaches. Um, I've shown you some of these for the midbrain. I showed you the orbitozygomatic transylvian. I showed you the contralateral transcolosal transcoroidal approach. Um, and I also showed you um, this, uh, um, uh, actually that's on the next slide. I showed you the contralateral super cerebellum, but you can see there are many choices that you have here to reach the midbrain. Um, and it really requires careful study to see where the lesion comes to the surface and how best to line up your trajectory with the lesion's access. In the ponds, um, again, a lot of choices uh, listed here. These check marks are the workhorses. I showed you the um, transmittal cerebellar peduncle approach. The trans CP angle approach is another variation of that. Um, this. Um, uh, transventricular approach is a real workhorse. I did not show you that one, but I think we're all familiar with that one. And um, I didn't also show you this transpontal medullary sulcus approach. That's another uh, beautiful approach that we published on years ago that uh, is really valuable for inferiorly, anteriorly located pontine lesions. The list for the medulla is a lot shorter. Um, these are either the transventricular approach or the far lateral approach. Uh, but again, you can see that um, uh, a lot of different choices, the choices and decisions you make really affect the outcome. Um, so to wrap this up, you know, I'll say this, patient selection is the secret. So uh, I would really encourage you to use that brainstem cavernous malformation grading system that we've developed. I think it's very valuable. Uh, look for where the lesion comes to the surface. Choose your approach uh, and your entry zone very safely. Um, and then, um, you know, I think there's a really fine line that we walk <clears throat> between complete resection and getting the job done and going too far and causing morbidity. So I think uh, that's just something we have to always bear in mind with these cases. So uh, with that, I am going to uh, exit and stop my screen share and uh, turn this back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lord. Now, Sam, it's all yours, Sam. Yes, yes, I am here. Okay. Professor uh, Yuha, are you here, Sam? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got confused. Okay. <laughs> Professor Yuha will uh, start uh, our discussion about this uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank Professor, you, Mike. Uh, 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 thank you, Professor Lawton, for this magnificent uh, 
work and uh, for accepting uh, our invitation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's you, uh, Professor Yuha. Mm, thank you, Michael Lawton. Thank you, Michael, very much for wonderful lecture. It was uh, full of uh, excellent surgical thinking, wonderful illustration to learn, and uh, very good surgical technique. So I learned a lot. Coming from a small country, we cannot get so many that kind of cases. So, so I really learned a lot. And, uh, the beautiful illustration and the, the great uh, photos of the surgical techniques, videos, so you could operate with you. <laughs> it was a very good experience. I thank you very much and uh, I appreciate very much. So I, I think everyone following this lecture. Thank you, uh, you very uh, much. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, one thing I didn't see in your list, you are not using subtemporal approach. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the subtemporal approach. Um, um, it's certainly a, a useful approach for um, lateral midbrain lesions, um, going under the temporal lobe, cutting the tent. It's, um, it's uh, I think, a popular one. I, I find on these webinars lately, um, more people are using that approach than I would have thought. I, I've just never been a fan of how much temporal lobe retraction you have to do to, um, to get down to the tentorium and work through that hole. And plus, um, uh, the other approaches work so nicely. The, the gravity, the addition of gravity to some of those other approaches that go transtentorially from below um, really makes them so nice to, to work with. I think. Um, People have a natural reluctance to do a sitting position and to work from so far away from the lesion. But um, the combination of trajectory and gravity really make uh, some of those other approaches really nice. I totally agree. I, I like to have sitting position. I could introduce even in China that uh, in resistance of many anesthetists, we could make it and I, I like to do in sitting position. But subtemporal, I, th I think, is a very good approach. You have to have some tricks, not destroy the temporal lobe, spinal, uh, lumbar drainage, and so. But uh, I, I have found it very useful, in, especially in brainstem cavernomas, because it gives very simple approach. And uh, of course, also sitting position. So otherwise, I can only say that I learned a lot. Thank you, Yuha. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, now uh, we will uh, take uh, questions from uh, panelists. Please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Uh. But uh, there, is, there is one question from uh, Dr. Abhijam. Uh, he was asking Professor Lawton if, if a subchoroidal approach is uh, good enough uh, rather than interfonical approach for the interthalamic cavernoma. Yeah, um, I think it's important that we get our terminology really clear. Um, there are basically three approaches that we need to talk about. One is the interfornoceal approach, which I did not show you. The other is the um, transchoroidal approach, which is um, lateral to the fornix. And then the third is the subchoroidal, which is actually lateral to the choroid plexus. And so each one is progressively more lateral. And um, I've not been a fan of the interfornoceal approach because um, it's a lot of manipulation on both fornices. And um, I really don't like to risk a memory deficit in my patient. Uh, they can be really uh, uh, devastating or um, uh, really life-altering. So um, I, I, I've shied away from the interfornoceal approach. The, the transchoroidal fissure approach is nice because the anatomy um, really opens well uh, when you follow the venous anatomy and mobilize that anatomy laterally. Um, uh, the subchoroidal approach is nice. Uh, I have a beautiful case I could, could have shown you, but um, I use that when um, lesions are a little bit more laterally. The, 
the choroid plexus adds an additional layer of protection between you and the fornix. And so going subcoroidally or lateral to the choroid plexus can be uh, protective of the fornix, but um, it does do some funny things to the anatomy. It, it makes you work within the venous angle. Uh, you, you have the opening of the foramen of Monroe, you have the opening of the subcoroidal space, but then you have the thalamostriate vein running in between. So it does um, limit you a little bit, um, but for selected cases, it, um, it's fine. And I think uh, you can make your choice between those three. Mike, can I ask you one question? <clears throat> Mike, I so, want to know, yeah. <laughs> you always ask me questions. <laughs> Mike, what, uh, you know, obviously, cavernomas have to be removed completely. There is no question. Suppose in a post-operative situation, you find a small amount of cavernoma left behind. You will like to go again or what, what would you like to do? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I am a believer that um, if you're going to do this surgery right, you have to do curative resection, 100%. And if you see uh, remnant post-operatively on your films, then I take patients back. Um, if for some reason, um, you know, the, the, there's reason not to try and take that last bit because it's so eloquent or because, you know, maybe the patient just refuses the surgery, then um, there are those cases where I don't. But um, usually taking them back to the OR in the perioperative period is very straightforward. Um, it's very instructive for, uh, for us as surgeons to do that. Um, you'll see from me a paper. I'm, uh, it's in press right now on my experience with residual brainstem cavernous malformations. We had 14 out of about 200 and some odd. Um, so it, it does happen. And I think um, when you're trying to walk that fine line between taking it all and not hurting the patient, you, you are, we are at risk for leaving a little bit. But my, my residual rate was around 5%. It was 6% early. It dropped to 4% later. And um, uh, I think, you know, it's almost impossible to get that to zero because sometimes if you push too hard in the brainstem, um, you can hurt people. And you also have the problem of corners or blind spots, as I call them, where you're looking down a long corridor and uh, you can't see uh, around those spaces. And, you know, it, it's easy to miss a little bit. So it's going to happen. Another thing, you know, what you didn't touch in your lecture, maybe... I want to know about some venous situation, venous anomalies or large veins around the cavernoma. Yeah, and well. How, how you handle, what is your thinking process in those cases? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. I think um, some of the dogma around venous malformations is that you, you have to preserve them and you can't sacrifice them. And I completely agree. I think you have to preserve them. But I think it's also important to remember that um, the venous malformation is a caput medusa, meaning it's got a trunk, which is like my wrist, and it's got the, the snakes um, or the, the branches. And it's okay to take a branch up here. You just can't violate the trunk. I think when you violate the trunk and you uh, close off that venous flow, that's when you get complications. But um, to get the malformation fully resected when there's a finger right around it, I think that's um, okay to do, and, and I think it's important to make that differentiation. Um, that's what allows you to get these curative resections that we were just talking about. Um, but uh, again, um, uh, preservation of the trunk is, is key, and I think um, uh, there was one video in particular where I, I had to dissect a lot along the vein just to get it mobile and work around it, and I think that's the those are the kinds of steps you have to take. And the other thing I would say is that um, Dr. Spetzler used to say that there's always a venous malformation, 100% of the time. And I think um, that's probably not the case. Um, it's probably not 100%, but it's, it's really high. It's probably 75% of the cases. So you have to be on the lookout for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, how often have you seen a, a Lee hemorrhage uh, in these residual lesions? Rebleeds in the... Yeah, well... Um, I think it's quite common. In fact, um, most of the time, that's how these recurrences uh, present, or at least convince you that they're real. Um, uh, sometimes you'll see them immediately. Sometimes you'll see them at three months or three years. But when um, when you have um, when you have that, it's unmistakable that you've got a, a residual that's left behind. 
Um, and I think their, their, bleed rate, their bleed rate in our review in that paper I was mentioning was about the same as what their baseline rate is. So even though you've taken a very large malformation and reduced it to just a tiny little remnant, um, it bleeds at the same frequency. So, um, you know, um, that's another reason to be aggressive on there. Uh, Dr. Lawton, uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, you didn't also show uh, transventricular approaches because you do it very, very, very rarely, a transport ventricular approach to pontine or medullary cavernomas. Do you do it very rarely? No, I, I didn't show it, not because I don't do it very rarely, it's because I think all of us are so familiar with that. Uh, I don't have a lot to teach because it's a, it's a simple suboccipital, you split the tonsils, you go up through the vollecula, you ex expose the floor of the fourth. Um, so I, I think I, all of us know that. That's probably the easiest of all of these brainstem approaches, but it's a workhorse. I use it all the time. Thank you, Sil, for uh, your uh, magnificent uh, lecture. Uh, please stay with us uh, till the end of the session, I hope, because there was there were uh, a lot of questions for you. But uh, we have uh, we have uh, to shift to uh, our next speaker. Thank you.